When the Most High apportioned the nations, he divided man, humankind. Uh, he fixed the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of their gods. Really? That's the way the NRS, the, 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 uh, the new sta revised standard does it, because they take it from the Septuagint. Kind of interesting. Kind of interesting. But let's go further. One of the most interesting glimpses we get into that unseen world behind the scenes is in Daniel 10. Daniel 10 is a prelude to the climax of the book of Daniel, chapter 11 and 12, the big, big ones. But in Daniel chapter 10, Daniel is drawn into a time of fasting and prayer for 21 days. Interesting period of time. At the end of those 21 days, he's visited by a messenger. I'm not going to get into who the messenger is right now. There's some debates of exactly who. But the point is, he comes with a messenger. The messenger basically says to him that he has been trying to get through for 21 days. When you first started, I was sent. For 21 days, I was what we would call in military terms, interdicted by some personage called the Prince of Persia. He's not talking about the King of Persia. He's talking about the spirit being behind the Persian Empire. This spirit being was able to intrude himself to prevent this messenger from accomplishing his mission. Now, there's a footnote to this that we don't know. It's conjectural, but it's interesting. You, you sort of assume that you, from the text that there's a linkage between the 21 days of fasting and prayer and the 21 days it took the messenger to get through, right? You sort of wonder, what would have happened if Daniel sort of broke off his fast after 19 days? I don't know. I have a suspicion that might have prevented the messenger from getting through. Well, gee, how come we don't have more messengers? Well, I don't know how many of you fasted for 21 days. And I'm just being a little flippant, but with the point, okay? Now, what this messenger goes on to say is that I'm going to give you these neat two chapters, 11 and 12, but as soon as I've done that, I've got to go back and fight this guy again. And after him, the prince of Greece will follow. So there's apparently another spirit being that's behind the Greek empire. What makes that kind of provocative, the Greek empire surfaces in history 200 years after Cyrus and the Persians and all that. Now that's all there is. There's just this strange murky, and then it goes on, the messenger goes on and gives Daniel an incredible two chapters. They're so incredible that the critics have had to late date them because they detail the history that follows later. Amazing. But it's an interesting glimpse. There's something going on behind the scenes. There's apparently a demonic personage called the Prince of Persia, Prince of Greece. You sort of wonder, is there a Prince of the United States? I think he's buckling up the knees at the moment, but we move on. Um, <laughs> now, I want to take this to the personal level. There's another insight that's classic from the Old Testament that I thought would be kind of fun just to take a look at, and that's in 2 Kings 6. The king of Syria warred against, the, uh, against Israel. He took counsel with the servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. So the king of Syria is saying this in the privacy of his military councils, right? And the man of God, who incidentally is Elisha, sent unto the king of Israel, his buddy, of course, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself there, not once or twice. In other words, this is a pattern. King of Syria lays out a plan. Elisha tips off the king of Israel so he can duck that ambush or whatever. Not just once or twice, it was a pattern. And obviously, the king of Syria is upset. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing, for he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? In other words, who's the mole? Who's the mole, right? One of the servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet that is in Israel telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. This is the first recorded instance in the Old Testament of a phone tap. Okay? <laughs> So king of Syria now knows where to go. He's going to go after this guy. He said, go and spy where he is that I may send him and fetch him. And it was told him saying, behold, he's in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses, chariots, tanks, bazookas, whatever, and a great host. Little Mr. Translation there. 
And um, they came by night and compassed the city around about. So there's the little town Dothan, the Roswell of Judea or whatever, okay? And uh, it's surrounded now by the Syrian army, okay? Now, <laughs> let's take a look at the physical situation. When the servant of the man of God was risen in the morning, early, gone forth, behold, the host compassed the city both with horses and chariots, and his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? He's panicked. He looks out in the morning, and, you know, there they are. Now, this is the spiritual assessment. Elisha says to his servant, don't sweat it, Ace. No, he says, fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Now, I don't know what went through the servant's mind. You know, I suspect he thought, gee, that sounds like a platitude out of one of your sermons. Hey, fella, I can hear their engines running out there. They're revving up their engines. They're out there, boss. That's sort of the way I visualize this. He's... He hears the, well, you know, we're spiritually okay, but come on, there they are, right? Elisha gets the picture. Elisha prays. And you can almost hear his almost disdain or, or, or uh, frustration with his servant. He says, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. Simple little prayer. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and what did he see? As he looked out there, of course, he saw all the Syrian armament. But he also saw the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire surrounding Elisha. That's not a cliche. That's not a religious platitude inserted by some scribe. Holy Spirit put that there for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is to let us understand the part of the space, the space dimension we see, we talked about that this morning, is limited. The um, Dachmanides in the 12th century concluded from Genesis 1 that we live in 10 dimensions. Four are directly knowable, six are not knowable directly. That's his parlance out of the text of Genesis 1. The particle physicists today tell us that we live in 10 dimensions. Four of them are directly measurable, length, width, height, and time. Six of them, as they would put it, are curled in less than 10 to the minus 33 centimeters and therefore are only inferable by indirect means. That's using expressions of vector calculus. So the point is, you know, what Nachmanides did by doing his homework in Genesis 1, we've spent millions of dollars on atomic accelerators to learn the same thing. But all right, point is, you don't have to go to outer space or something to find dimensionalities that apparently are inhabited by beings. And I'm not assuming that the angels are outside the time domain. God is, they, aren't, they, they ain't, okay? And I don't know how many of you had your first grade teachers told you about using the word ain't. It's a perfectly good Jewish word. <laughs> Did you know that ain is a verb in the Hebrew? I wish I'd known that when I was in grammar school, but anyway. <laughs> so what is our threat assessment? Paul tells us we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world. Democratic national power, no, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> whoa, whoa, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't really mean to do that. Whitewater's not over till the first lady sings, I understand. <laughs> against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So our resource is not Genesis 6, it's Ephesians 6. And just to anticipate the conclusion here, I'm going to ask each of you that have taken this conference seriously, to make a commitment between you and the Lord to undertake a serious study of Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. We won't do it here tonight because we've got other things to cover. We'll touch probably on some of that tomorrow morning. If this, I have quite a, a Sunday morning service, I'll let the Lord lead. We'll see what comes, but I suspect we'll touch upon that unless the Lord 
show there's something else tomorrow morning at Calvary Chapel goes to me, or at Calvary Chapel at Roswell. But anyway, um, but make yourself a commitment. I don't think you can understand the Old and New Testament unless you understand Genesis 6. We covered that this morning. But your resource is not in Genesis 6, your resource is in Ephesians 6. Easy to remember. Paul tells us, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God. That's an imperative. It doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't happen because you've been spirit-filled on some occasion. Not that I'm knocking that, don't misunderstand me. It's something you have to do. You have to put on, not your favorite pieces, the whole he says it twice in the passage, by the way. Put on the whole armor of God. When do you do that? During the battle? Before the battle. By the way, you're already on enemy turf, so think about it. Put on the whole armor of God. There are seven elements. You need to understand what they are in order to put them on. If you don't do that, you are a sitting duck. 